building of the School of Theology in Anne Howard Shaw was the first woman to be ordained in the Methodist tradition, so we just rock women's empowerment. But um, three years ago, Uche Awa, who you'll meet in a little bit, uh, came up with the idea to have the Multicultural Expo because SPH has a bunch of people from all over um, the world, and so we wanted to um, celebrate everybody. So we celebrate with dance and music, conversation, and of course, food. Um, so I uh, thank you for coming, and you'll get a chance to meet Uche in a, a little bit. He is also head of staff in the Shaw Center, and of course, our director, Dr. Che, who is our cheerful leader. Woohoo! Cheerless? Cheerless. 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 Anywho, that's on camera. Um, <laughs> make it my little proud. <laughs> space with our brothers and sisters at the SPH community. We thank you for the food that will nourish our minds, our bodies, and our souls. And as we partake the food, let us remember those around the country who does not have food at the moment. Bless this moment, bless this event, in your name we pray, amen. 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 So I wanted to also make a note that um, we're grateful to have people from within and outside the SPH community. This reaches um, people from Harvard Divinity School, Northeastern, all over. So we're really grateful for that. And so um, as you sit and eat in a moment, I encourage you to sit next to someone that you don't know. Um, try to get to someone, know to someone new. So we're going to have dinner. So the way that it's going to work is that on the other side of that partition, there is delicious food from Korean food to Indonesian food. There is some Nigerian food and some Mexican food. So it's all going to be delicious and I hope you enjoy it. And so Tori, who is out in the hallway here, is going to kind of direct you around. So you'll just go out of this door, like a little Tetris, <laughs> grab around and um, grab food. It's food is open on both sides of the table. It's the same thing. Um, and then bring your food back in as you are walking around. You can see the beautiful eclectic um, tablecloths on the table as well that represent different cultures. And then just come back in here, grab, um, enjoy your food, and then we'll get to it. <laughs> I'm going to get us rolling along, so I invite you to keep getting up to grab food if you need. But we're going to get the program started with our first wonderful culture from the Congo. And this is presented by a uh, first year MDiv student here at School of Theology, Trey. So give it up for Trey. Because we have two common in Africa. We have a Brazilian and um, sorry for that. Okay. We have a two Congos. We have a um, Democratic of Congo and then we have a Brazilian. So I from Congo Democratic. Sorry for that.
Democratic of Congo, it's located in the, in the central, and it's the second biggest country in Africa. And then we have our own 11 programs. I, I, my parents come from Equator, and then I was born in Kinshasa, where is the country? <coughs> so in Congo, we have a lot of tribes, like most 200 tribes. And um, the four, uh, okay. the four largest tribes are Wongo, Luba, and Congo, and Mangwetsu. So I'm coming from the Mongo tribe. And then we have uh, 700 local languages. So the majority of the Congolese speak on uh, one of the language, French, Lingala, is one of my, my language I love to, and Chiluba, and Swahili. Religion, Christianity is the majority, like everyone is more Christian. And then um, Kimbangist, uh, it's, a, it's a religion people believe, um, it's the African religion. Don't believe in anything. It's the African stuff. And then we have Islam, it's like a percent. Um, Congolese people love to dance and music. <laughs> those, are, those are the things we enjoy. Like, we still go with it in Africa. And then um, about the marriage. Uh, the marriage back in the day was like. Um, The marriage back in the day was like parents arranged, like, you know, and then you get married. Back right now, we don't do that anymore. Those are the old school stuff. Um, and then uh, right now, you can choose your girl or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you just talk about it, figure out that you get married. Um, and then um, to get married in Congo, you have to give some money. Like, if I'm gonna get married with any Congolese, I have to give some money. But the good thing about America, you, you don't give nothing. So that was my presentation. I wasn't already ready, and the last time about Congo, I don't really know, because it's big. Yeah, that was my part, so I'm fine. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you so much. You know. <laughs> church for a long time and there are so many mishaps just about every Sunday and the thing the pastor would say after all the mishaps is you know what God happens anyway <laughs> so I'm grateful that God is happening anyway on today so I before we move on I wanted to introduce you to your other MC for the night who is so beautifully dressed it is unbelievable Luce, please stand up and grace the world with your <laughs> So for those who are just arriving or did not hear, this is the brainchild of Luce, the Multicultural Expo, bringing together people from all over the world, sharing food, laughter, experiences, and stories. And so I'm super excited to work alongside Luce, and she will be introducing our next speaker while I get the, by I, I mean Tori, <laughs> gets the tech stuff going. All right, so let's get this going. So um, I'm really excited all of you were able to make it this evening. This means a lot to us. And yeah, Hazel said, my brainchild. I wish I could take all the credit for this, but mm, no, I won't. <laughs> so I'm gonna give us a little brief, Dr. Che here, here. So I'm gonna tell you a little brief history about this event. Uh, we were having an office meeting scheduled, and I was, it was my first time there, and I, <laughs> and I was like, oh, my, my colleague who was working with me had this, you know, she's gonna bring up something. But on second thought, something was like, let's get ready, you know, you never know. And I got there at the meeting, my first time, and she goes, 
So what, what do you guys have planned for us this semester? And then my colleague goes, nothing, I don't have anything planned. And everybody was looking at me, I was like, shoot. I was like, okay, I have this in mind. And they helped me create this beautiful thing that we all, I joined for the third time around. So I cannot take the credit because there was a sister who stood by me when this was happening for the first time. It looked so crazy. The pilot session was, you know, like something happened for the first time. You know how things just pop up. And this sister was with me. So please, I need you to indulge me for a minute. I want you all to stand up and give Elise Vest a hand. Woo! So Liberia has gone through a lot of hard times. A lot of people died. A lot of my family members also died. 
during this time, and um, it has gotten better over the years with the help of um, our first African president, female president, um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and we recently just elected, earlier this year, our new president, George Weah.
beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Christine. Um, well, I don't know if this was done, but I want to take time to acknowledge some important people in our meet. So if you know you don't school here, could you please raise your hand? If you don't school here, in the no, School of Theology. If you're not a student here. Welcome. 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 Thank you. I don't want to make you guys stand up or introduce yourself, but we get to know you as the day progresses. So um, Christy said something. She said that in Liberia they have this English, we call ours pidgin. So I'm going to teach you something tonight. Yeah, you're going to learn some Nigerian pidgin tonight. So if, um, if you meet someone like a Nigerian and you want to say, how are you doing, you know, what's up with you, you just say, how far? How far? Now remove the R and go, how far? How far? Exactly. So when you see like God, you say, how far? You say, I day. That's, I'm, I day. I'm here. You know, I'm good. I stand. Which means I'm standing on my feet. Two feet. All right. So I won't go too far with that. So moving along. So from now on, if I see you all, I expect you to say, how far? And I'll respond, I day. And if I ask you, you say, I day. So if you're more than one, if I say how far, you can say we day. Good. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> um, moving along. Okay, um, our next presenter, all the way from Harvard Divinity School, it's Fatima El Baruch. Baruri? No, I messed it up. I'm so sorry, Fatima. Forgive me. Okay, Fatima from Harvard. And she's going to be ta talking about the Egyptian culture. Oh, it's India. Sorry. My handwriting is really bad. So the arrow that's pointed here actually is to our friend from Northeastern, so you'll be up a little later. Oh, Thank great. you very much. Oh. Um, so we are My excited bad. to have people from um, different universities represented here. And so from Northeastern, we have Sager Rajpal. Sager Rajpal. Rajpal. Yeah. Sorry. Who will be talking about Indian culture. So welcome.
sends with her sisters and her kids. Uh, that's the two sisters and these are the two kids. Uh, one, of, uh, one of her kids is uh, Ganesha, who is the elephant headed god, which is most common in, uh, in our, uh, it, it's one of the most important gods because he is the god of goodwill. And who doesn't need goodwill? Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, the nine nights. Now, uh, on the nine nights, these nine goddesses are uh, are revered and invoked, one for each night. They all represent these different uh, aspects of human emotion and different expressions. So it's basically invoking this expression in you every night. Um, and on the 10th, and this is how we culturally, or there's a lot of cultural things also in North India, uh, the Durga, uh, when she ascends with her uh, sisters and her uh, children, that's when people, you know, put uh, uh, colors on each other. There's also a lot of dance that happens. It's called Garba. Um, and uh, it, these are very flowy dresses and people you know, uh, dancing all around. It's, it's, it's a big thing in India right now. There are, I mean, as we speak, I think there are a lot of Indians doing this back home. Um, India is 79% uh, Hindu, uh, but also uh, it's, all, it's about 10%, it's about 8% to 10% uh, Muslim. And uh, then we have Sikhs, <coughs> we have Zoroastrianism, we have the world's largest Baha'i community, about 300,000 uh, people who are Baha'i. Uh, but uh, culturally, everyone takes part in everyone's uh, faith practices, if not that, at least the culture. Um, so the 10th day of this uh, uh, is, that is tomorrow in, in here, but according to the time uh, difference, it's the 10th day in India now. That is the Vijay Dashmi. Vijay Dashmi uh, basically means uh, the victorious 10th day. That is when, uh, according to legend, um, a demon king was destroyed by one of uh, our gods. Um, that is when big effigies of Ravana uh, are erected and burned. Uh, that is when they say good uh, prospers, uh, good conquers evil. Um, so uh, that's how they celebrate Dashera, which is the 10th day of these nine nights. Um, however, um, evil as a concept is very different, is very loose in the East. Uh, evil is not a very uh, objective concept back home. It's, it's uh, evil by definition could be absence of God, but back home, according to Indian tradition or Indian theology or Hindu theology, Indic mythology, uh, everything came out of God. So nothing can be inherently evil. So evil is a very loose term and most people don't use it, but because of the lack of better word, they just use evil, but it's essentially good over bad. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my presentation. Well, among this group of amazing people from all over. We have so much talent in this space, and I'm excited to invite up one of the very talented people that I know who is our Dean, uh, <laughs> Associate Dean of Students and Community Life. One day I will get that title right. Um, <laughs> if you don't know Dr. Teddy, you're gonna know him today. <laughs> and if you have not been blessed by his voice, you will be blessed on today. Yeah. 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 Our very own Dr. Kay.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Hazel, for that wonderful introduction. So uh, this is the Multicultural Expo. I'm so wonderful <coughs> glad to be here. Um, my family is, um, we hop countries every generation. And so <laughs> my grandparents <coughs> are from Barbados, and they moved to Panama and had their children there, both sets. And so my mother and father met there, so they're Panamanian. And then um, I was born in Boston, so I'm a first generation American. Wow. Um, so in terms of like growing up as a child, my, my, my father and mother were missionaries and my early childhood was always at some uh, church service or another and across Latin America in different places. And so my earliest memories of church were either you know, around the feet of people under a tree somewhere or under a tent or in somebody's house. Um, and that was my sort of entrance into church life. It wasn't a building, it was these people. And we would just get together and we would sing coritos. And then they would read scripture and talk about it. And then we'd sing more coritos. And then we would eat a lot of food. And then we would sing more coritos. <laughs> Um, so coritos are just little short choruses of, of different Christian songs, and we would sort of sing one into the other. Mm -hmm. So if you wouldn't mind, if you could help me, uh, uh, I don't have any music, so if you could just clap for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> States, you know, we did the typical immigrant thing, which was like, you got to speak English perfectly, you better not speak anything. So I, they stopped speaking Spanish to me. So I lost my Spanish. And um, so I, was, I wasn't I was Spanish enough to hang out with the Latinos, but I also wasn't black enough to be, hang out with black kids. And so to find my space, my voice became my way in that people would embrace. Oh. Uh, because if I can sing soul music, then I must be black, right? Then I <laughs> <laughs> and one of my favorite soul singers, like who I learned how to sing by singing his music, is an artist by the name of Donny Hathaway. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a song that he sings that I really love. Um, it's a, it's not a great moral, it's not a really great moral song. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's about a one night stand. But, um, but I have reinterpreted that song, me, and it really is. <laughs> and for me, for me, it really is about uh, 
um, treasuring the time that you have with um, really important people, uh, particularly moments that, that don't last forever, and learning how to appreciate them, and in that appreciation, you extend their, their meaning throughout the rest of your life, and not just for that moment. <coughs> so to me, it speaks a lot to the way I feel about um, the School of Theology, because being a school is very transitory. People come, and then they go. But the, the impact we make on, on each other really lasts. So I'm going to sing to you out of this part of my culture um, a Donny Hathaway song. It goes like this. <clears throat> For all we know, we may never meet again. Children who are going to close us out, but if they'd like to go 
now and parents feel like that is the better option. <laughs> Let's do it! <laughs>
having fun. Yes. Yes. Hazel and I walk tirelessly. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> sure you're all smiling today. So how far? Please do. Please do. I do. I do. I do. I do. Yes, please. I do. Okay, our next speaker is from Uganda and Martin. Martin. shared with me and maybe others, he prefers to go by Mugera, which is his given name, Mugera, which is a family name, correct? That's right. So right. let's greet Mugera. Mugera. glad to be here. I have my drum. This brings separateness into this place. It's already separate, but I like carrying it around. Um, so I'm from Uganda, and uh, those are my name. I'm Martin Mugerwa Mukere the fourth. I prefer to go by Mugerwa. That's my clan name. Um, so I'm gonna. I'm from Uganda, Uganda is in East Africa, uh, bordering um, Congo in the west, and then we have Tanzania in the south, so South Sudan in the north, and Kenya in the south, I mean the east. Uh, so that map shows the major tribes we have in Uganda. We have more than 20, but those are the major ones. And I don't know if you could see Kampala. Kampala is mm -hmm. all the way down near Lake Victoria. Mm -hmm. So um, the whole of the green, that's where I come from. That's my culture, the biggest culture. And uh, <coughs> it is the only, culture, the only tribe that has the one language. So all people living in that green area speak one language. Others, they speak multiple languages. Mm. And our official language is uh, English and Swahili. Uh, so we share Swahili with the Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, Tanzania. So we have an East African Confederation whereby um, we do business together. We can travel through those countries. So uh, we have East African passport. So it's kind of open to all those countries. So that's our traditional uh, dress. You see how I, uh, I'm dressed up. So basically, uh, they, they are all in different colors depending on which uh, celebration or event. So that one, you are going to a wedding, an introduction. So basically, when you date, uh, uh, someone you hug to visit the family mm -hmm. and you bring a couple of your family members and friends to go with you and visit uh, uh, So that's the traditional dress for women. Wow. Women have a very special place in my culture and all over the cultures in Uganda. So that one is the common one in all cultures. Um, we call it gomas. It has a long story connected with India, so, but I will not go into detail with that. Um, so this is one of the uh, cultural dresses, specifically for cultural events. And that one is specific, uh, specifically for the dance, particular dance, uh, for some events. And that culture is from the Eastern Uganda. Uh, this one is uh, northeast. Those are called Kalamajongs. Mm -hmm. So the Kalamajongs are so special. Uh, there is expre expression in Uganda which goes that we can't wait Kalamajongs to develop. So um, they were the most uh, very traditional people. 
uh, they are so attached with their traditions. So it took a while to get them move together with other parishes. And they are so close to Kenya and they share a lot with Turkanas and Maasai's in Kenya. They are traditional pastoralists and cattle keepers. That's all what they do. So basically their diet depends on, on products from cows and goats. So they drink a lot of milk. And so this one is from also Eastern Kaisha. Um, it is one of the best dances I love. Um, it is dance uh, during the coronation of the kings of uh, and the royal families. It's having a celebration, so that kind of dance is. Uh, this one is from the Western Uganda. It's pretty much connected with the Rwanda. Uh, they sh uh, people from Western Uganda, their culture is so close to Rwanda and Burundi. So they're kind of connected. Uh, so uh, that's the, the female dress. And this is from Uganda, the central. So that's a very, very traditional dance. Uh, it is used in multiple celebrations, can be used in churches. And usually, this is the main drum with it. Yeah. So, um, we do a lot of that, that dance uh, during the weddings, during other celebrations, but also during services, mm -hmm. like in religion. Uh, and this one was one of the coronations uh, that took place in 1993. I was still a kid, but that's my king. Mm -hmm. So that was his coronation. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is very traditional. The king, the kings we have in Uganda, they are more respected than, than even the, uh, the state, the president. Oh. So people, uh, they are very loyal to the traditional. Mm -hmm. So uh, if the president of Uganda came to the same place, some event with the king, people would uh, lift up the king the way he is, and he never steps on the ground. Mm. Oh. So the ground is all covered. Mm. And the, nobody steps where he steps. Mm. So this is a very, very important thing with the king. Mm. So, um, and that is also a king from, that was one of the biggest empire we had uh, in East Africa. Mm. And he's a king from the West. Uh, that is a traditional royal tomb. So all the kings of Uganda, the central, they are buried uh, there. And there is this weird tradition when the king dies. Actually, I don't say the king dies. The king doesn't die. He just disappear. <laughs> yeah, you can't say that. Yeah. Yeah, the so when they disappear, <laughs> so um, they take off they take out of uh, the right jaw, like this one, is cut off, and mm. kept. So all the kings of Uganda for more than a thousand years, all their jaws are kept. Wow. In there. Wow. So now they opened up a museum, it's a very big shrine. Oh. And so, wow. these are some of the festivals we have in Uganda, we have a couple of them. Uh, I won't go into details, but uh, this one is um, Nyege Nyege. So Nyege Nyege brings all people come together with cultural backgrounds and basically it's about food and music and all dances. They are all traditional. Uh, this one too is Nyege Nyege, uh, Nyege, Nyege dance. Uh, uh, this one, uh, we have film festivals. Usually we call it moving images. So people really act as if they are not people, they are just images. It's one of my favorite. I never missed that one. <laughs> um, so <laughs> these are kind of girls. So we still have virgins. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, I say that. <laughs> that is very traditional. And in our culture, in all of our cultures in Uganda, right? So they respect virgins. And in such a celebration, they are brought out. Uh, kind of, they are well, well respected, nobody touches them. Uh, so, 
all, <laughs> that's one of our favorite gym. I don't drink apples. Too strong, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you ever come to the festivals, that's one of the biggest. So uh, lastly, we have religions in Uganda. The biggest thing is Christianity. We take about eighty percent, and the, uh, the next major one is uh, Islam. So this one we have a big celebration on uh, June third. It is the Martyrs' Day. So uh, in I think uh, 1800, around there, a lot of Christians were murdered by the king of Uganda. Mm -hmm. So they were burned, and some of them were beheaded in that place because they disobeyed the king and took up Christianity. So uh, it brings a lot of people all over Africa and all over the world. So those are some of the celebrations, the traditional dances. So we incorporate a lot of traditions into our uh, liturgy and practices. So uh, those are religious, uh, that's the choir. Mm -hmm. It's a big thing. Uh, we still do as part of uh, Ugandan communities and uh, communities from East Africa who are outside, who who live here in the US, we do have a big celebration for that, that too. So uh, those are a couple of pictures. Uh, Thank you so much for listening. Wow. So thank you guys for staying. Uh, we only have two more presenters. You know, we've shifted things around. So, OK, finally. <laughs> I know. Well, this time around, I decided to, I felt if there was a need to open our community more to outside Boston and bring people in to share the culture with us. And that's why it's a girl, sub, sub, girl. Sager. 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 Like Lager. Huh? Like Lager. Sager. 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 Wow. Beautiful. And he agreed to present his culture to us and Fatima from he's from Northeastern University by the way. So please give him a round of Fatima is from Harvard, I said that already. And I spoke with them and they indulged me. So I'm so happy they came and we can see we're learning so much. And when you were speaking about the feminism and you heard the room, you know, we're like, Yes, <laughs> we are goddesses. <laughs> So um, this time around, I'll be inviting um, Fatima to come and share her Egyptian culture with us. Mm. Fatima! Um, what about Egyptian? 
industry. Uh, again, I'm only going to go into it because we're one of the oldest countries in the world. Yeah. Um, and so, um, most of you probably know Egypt from the pyramids and Giza and Cleopatra and all the temples, um, wow. which modern Egyptians are also very proud of. <laughs>
southern Egypt and northern Sudan called Nubia. And this is a um, ancient kingdom that is still like many people there are still indigenous and who and very, like the homes look exactly as you see them right there. Um, and um, this is Cairo and this is a street in Upper Egypt, um, which is actually all of southern Egypt like geographically. Yeah. Um, and then this is my family, this is my little brother. <laughs> to uh, bring up our wonderful friend from Singapore, Ooh. who is also Cali and Heart, which I resonate with a lot as a Californian, <laughs> and, and more than Heart in real life, excuse me. Um, so welcome up. <laughs> okay, wait, I gotta tell the story, I'm sorry. So Jaira Ko, who's gonna come up here, the first time I met him, I heard his name was Jaira. In my very Baptist upbringing, I was like, Jehovah Jireh! <laughs> Which is, for those who don't know, my provider. God, my provider. But, anyways, it's, I think it's like not pronounced Jireh, like the way that black people pronounce it is like not really the way it's pronounced, but to make it rhyme with everything else in the song, it's Jireh. So, anyways, Jireh Co. <laughs> methodological notes because I think they're important. Uh, so one, I'm addressing a predominantly US audience today in the context of a US university. Uh, so ban chewing gum, pristine streets, the rooftop pool in the Marina Bay Sands Hotel, Changi Airport and efficiency. So I'm guessing this list probably covers what most people in the audience know about Singapore, <laughs> which is okay. We are like, the country's half the size of LA, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not but, what that means is that my contribution today will probably register as a significant contribution to a lot of people's conceptions of Singapore. So number two, the list of Singaporean characteristics I just gave should be summarized as strict, safe, and sterile. But not backwards. Anything but backwards. That is, Singapore doesn't inhabit the global south imaginary that needs to remind the global north of the ways that we are modern or civilized. Yeah. Civilized, wow. right? Mm -hmm. So all that is to say, my presentation at this expo doesn't, doesn't, doesn't take place in a vacuum. Most people don't know a whole lot about Singapore, and what they do know tends to be a glossy, clean representation. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of wary about being complicit in representations of Singapore that trumpet its westernized, civilized face and erase its dirty laundry. But I'm just as aware that I'm presenting to a US-based audience and that the Singaporean government has exploited sloppy, new imperial foreign critiques of Singapore to protect itself from all kinds of criticism. So for those reasons, what I'm going to try and do today is present a Singapore that just doesn't fit well into any of the neat boxes you've been given before, that doesn't fit well into a cultural presentation, I'm sorry, and because tidy representations are what the Singaporean public relations machine has done with much success, and to great loss, in my opinion. So, it used to be that when people found out that I was from Singapore, they talked to me about chewing gum, the airport, or the food. But lately, it's just been have you seen Crazy Rich Asians? Is it accurate? Wow. Is it real? <laughs> so, with how much Crazy Rich Asians is functioning as the face of Singapore to the US, I thought it would be a great entry point for a cultural presentation. So first off, I don't think there's any one Singapore, <coughs> kind of like what Fatima was saying about Egypt, right? So instead of telling you whether the movie is real or not real, I'm going to try to contextualize the movie with some contemporary and historical elements that hopefully complicate your conception of Singapore. <laughs> So in Crazy Rich Asians, the Singaporean young family that Constance Wu's character is trying to marry into made their wealth as real estate moguls. So you get lots of salivating shots of fancy houses in the movie, like this one. Like this one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, 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 it's, you know, it's a really nice house. Um, but you don't get ma 
many shots of the people who build them. So, mm. so construction work in Singapore is done almost exclusively by transient foreign workers. Mm. Wow. Mm. So I don't call them immigrant workers, however, because they have no means of staying in Singapore long term. Mm. Their legal immigration status is tied entirely to their specific employer, who can terminate them with relative ease. Workers have to pay often predatory agent fees in their home country to get the jobs in the first place. Think fees as high as $10,000, an astronomical sum, considering they can be paid as little as $400 a month after workers' dormitory room and board fees. If they're sent home, they forfeit the agent fees. So the employer's near absolute power in this situation makes it almost impossible for workers to get corroborating witnesses in the case of abuse, extortion, or wage theft because no one can afford to get sent home. Mm -hmm. So that's playing in the background when I see the ritzy buildings in Crazy Rich Asians. Mm -hmm. But Singapore's history of immigration cannot only be understood as exploitative. As early as the 10th century, well before Ch Singapore became a nation state, when it was just another part of the Malay archipelago, Chinese economic immigrants arrived in the archipelago and began intermarriage with the indigenous Malay. Their hybridized culture features a variety of religious beliefs with Chinese Taoist and Buddhist practice predominating, and Malay styles of dress. So they came to be known as the Peranakan or Baba Nunya. Okay, it says Peranakan on the left. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, Chinese people but wearing Malay styles of dress. Um, their peaceful integration but not complete assimilation into Malay community is, for me, a very helpful alternative to the binary of conqueror and conquer that dominates so much of our understanding of intercultural contact in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ironically enough, the blue mansion in Crazy Rich Asians is a Peranakan design. Mm -hmm. Okay, next thing. So Crazy Rich Asians is basically held together by weddings. Great, big, white, cis heterosexual, Methodist, exotic jungle destination weddings. I know there's a lot of adjectives, but <laughs> look, at, look at this, yeah. look at this image, you know. Like, I'm not making this up, it's right there. So, the centering of the cis heterosexual wedding is especially interesting in the current Singaporean moment. So the hot topic of the day back home is equal rights to marriage by way of decriminalizing men who have sex with men, a legal holdover courtesy of British colonial rule. Of course, the fiercest, best funded, and most organized opposition to this movement comes from the Singaporean church. In response to our one big LGBTQ rally uh, called Pink Dot, well, that's all pink, so just imagine everything in the picture of pink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many Singaporean Christians were galvanized to wear white in opposition under the auspices of a moral majority. So very loaded choices of words. So when I watched the endless parade of rich, Methodist, picture-perfect, heterosexual couples in Crazy Rich Asians get married, this is all also playing in the background. But they don't, they don't get to claim Singapore entirely for themselves either. As much as the government or churches might like to decry the LGBTQ movement as an entirely Western agenda, queerness has always been a part of Singapore, including the people indigenous to the Malay archipelago that Singapore was only distinguished from after colonization. So I'm just gonna quote uh, Dr. Joseph Goh. Nestled in the heart of Malaysian Borneo were the Manang Bali, a group of gender non-conforming shamans from the indigenous Iban tribe. Funnily enough, Crazy Rich Asians lead Henry Golding is of Iban descent. Oh, I skipped. This was the, the churches wearing white. Um, yeah, these are the Manang Bali, and this is uh, Henry Golding. So I, I personally can't stand him in the movie, but I understand that's not a popular opinion. And to show that I'm really trying to be charitable to the movie, I'll leave his face on for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure someone appreciates it. <laughs> okay, so back to Dr. Jo Joseph Goh. So according to existing resources, the Manang Bali receives directives through dreams from the Transform Patara, or deity, Manjaya Manang Raja, to become shamans. They must obey or face pain of death or madness. As part of responding to the spiritual calling, male-bodied individuals adopted the mannerisms, attire, and lifestyle of women, even taking on male partners as husbands. The gender and sexual transitions that occurred were integral to the initiation process of the shaman, adopting a new personal and social identity in order to serve the community. Due to these extreme requirements, the Manang Bali occupied the highest ranks of shamanhood. So, is Singapore crazy rich Asians, or is it exploited workers, or is it integrated immigrants? Is Singapore's sexual politics one of individualized liberalism versus a queer-phobic moral majority 
or one of indigenous queerness predating legal categories of homosexuality and uh, activist LGBTQ categories? Yeah, yes? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that yes. very informative and real presentation. Yeah. So let's give that a hand again. I think it's very important to um, have space to share those kinds of stories. And I, I think for the time we do this next year, we'll be putting in the folder for whoever is going to be leading this, because Jane are graduating. Um, <laughs> to really invite people to add more of that too. So thank you for offering that tonight. And thank you to all of our presenters from all over the world. Today. Thank you so much. It was great. All over the globe. Um, so I hope you've all had a wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, I want to invite, unbeknownst to her, but I'm volunteering her, uh, Dr. Che up. <laughs> to have the final word of thanks and gratitude for coming today. As you see, my kids are here, and they made a wonderful event today. So please give them a hand. We are doing this one every year, and it's actually because of Uche, who really want to see this is School of Theology as a multicultural community. And uh, as they said, I'm like all behind and try to support them because their visions are just uh, amazing. And they are the leaders of this school and uh, I believe you are now all part of this one. So thank you for coming and participating and contributing today. And uh, I believe our dean are still here and uh, I believe they are so all proud of you.